On today's show, we got to talk about the SEC and their 2025 opponents. Charlie Baker, the NCAA president, is uh, trying to ban something in betting. Uh, we got Caden Proctor and what he's going to uh, to do in the transfer portal. Clemson versus the ACC. The CFP financials are finalized. Trevor Etienne problems. Dion says he he's going to pull an Eli with his boys. All kind of stuff on today's Winning Cures Everything. Can you believe it? It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host, a confident young man, a superb athlete, Gary Seegers. All right, welcome to it. It's Winning Cures Everything. I'm your host, Gary Seegers. Oh, yes, it is the Wednesday, March 27th edition of the show. Hopefully, all of you are having wonderful Wednesdays thus far. It has been a while. That's right. Uh, you can follow me on all the different socials at Gary WCE. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at Winning Cures as well. Uh, if you would like to follow the show over there. Since we last spoke, uh, I had to make a trip to Costa Rica for about a week, and had a good time. Uh, got to spend a lot of time with a professional sports better. Uh, had a had a blast. Had an absolute blast. Felt good about the uh, the trip. Um, Everything went well. So, of course, uh, you want to see some of that stuff, go follow on YouTube and all the different socials. Uh, BetUS TV or BetUS.sports is the way to do that. So we had a, a good time. Good time doing that. A lot of fun. A lot of good information. I uh, had a blast. Had a blast. Don't don't know that I'll be down there uh, anytime in the near future. But that was fun to get down there and see the people that I've worked with for so very long on the Bet U.S. College Football Show. So, uh, let's talk about some of the stuff that's going on today. Uh, and just in the college football world in general, it was time for a check-in because, uh, God, there's been so much going on in this sport. We'll start off with topic number one, and that would be the SEC announced the 2025 opponents schedule. Right. So, basically, they're letting you know what the conference schedule is going to look like, not the dates necessarily, but who each team is going to play in 2025. And what they did is basically they took the 2024 schedule and just flipped it, like rode home. And while I understand doing that, the the other side of me is, okay, it appears that you're headed towards a nine-game schedule you have an opportunity to put some different games on the schedule. And, it, yes, we understand that it might not be fair that Alabama has to go to LSU next year and maybe they wouldn't get that return trip. But, like, who cares? You know, Alabama's going to Oklahoma this year. Okay, so Oklahoma wouldn't come back in 2025 if we changed up the schedule. Is it that big of a deal? Do you think Alabama fans would be totally fine with getting uh, who? Tennessee at home and Texas at home. I mean, it. you know, there are ways to make this work. And there was just no creativity whatsoever. Uh, they said, all right, screw it, we'll just do this. We'll just we'll keep it the same. Um, you know, everybody seems to think that they're going to go to nine games. And I, I just don't know that, I, that I'd see that happening unless ESPN is willing to, you know, come out of the pocketbook a little bit. There's no reason for the SEC to go to nine games. Now, it, we can say that it's to rotate more opponents, that it's to um, try and get to as many different, you know, it depends on if they expand anymore and whatnot. I mean, there's no telling what the future of the sport's going to look like, so it's really just a year-to-year thing. But they didn't have to announce this this early. I mean, they, they could have waited a little while, Um uh, but instead, you know, now we know exactly who they're going to play in 2025, and Alabama's going to have a tough schedule again, and Texas appears that they're going to have a little bit of an easier schedule. Uh, Georgia's schedule looks to be pretty tough, you know, et, et cetera. I, I'm not – I don't know. Ole Miss now has two different windows that they'll be able to uh, potentially go for a playoff berth, and that's a good thing. But I don't understand why 
you couldn't get a little bit more creative and rotate some different opponents. That That's what I don't get. Um, but it is what it is. So the SEC did announce it. It is out there. And most of their non-conference schedules are done. So the schedules are pretty much filled in. You just got to figure out what the dates are going to be. And I guess the dates will be a whole different thing. They'll put something on SEC Network, make it some big made-for-TV event, and then cheers to it. But we already know. So who knows? Who knows? Topic number two, NCAA President Charlie Baker, is he announced this morning, Wednesday, March 27th, that they are going to try and get college prop betting banned. Now, you're going to have to talk to a lot of regulators to get that done because that is one of the biggest novelty markets out there is college prop. And, and we're talking, you know, uh, so-and-so to get over 100 receiving yards or uh, Florida State running back, former Alabama running back, Roydale Williams, uh, his over-under in rushing yards against Clemson is 78.5. Right? Like those kind of things. Uh, who can, like, number of touchdowns, 1.5. You know, that, those kind of things. Those are the college props that they're trying to get banned. And they claim that it is in order to protect the players, which is what the NCAA's whole motto has been about forever, or at least that's what it was supposed to be. But they haven't done very much in protecting players in quite some time. The purpose for the NCAA is a couple of different things, Right? One, it is to protect the schools from litigation in the event that something heinous happened on the field, right? There, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is to get them to pass things such as what we talked about a couple of months ago when the SEC, not the SEC, when the NCAA banned uh, decorating hotel rooms. Like, it, there was no purpose in doing that, but you don't want to be the one that doesn't do it, right? If you've got a recruit that's going to Georgia and Texas and Ohio State, you don't want to be the one that didn't have the hotel room decorated by the time everybody gets there that morning. So, easy enough, right? I mean, it, that seems to make the most sense is get the NCAA to ban it, and that way nobody can do it, and it's that much easier. So, you've got... All the lawsuits and whatnot that the NCAA has to fight all the time. So you've got the legal matters. And then you've got the rinky-dink things that they ban from a rules perspective. Um, and then, of course, there's changing the the rules of the game. So the NCAA is going to be around for a while. But trying to ban college prop bets is a different deal, right? And it's they're, they're trying to... Avoid players being harassed for not hitting the over in rushing yards or uh, not hitting the total number of touchdowns, like if you went down before you got into the end zone uh, at the end of the game. You know, stuff like that, right? Where on social media, because these players are more accessible than they've ever been, you know, it, you've got kids that have gotten death threats. You've got kids that have, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the thing. I don't know that it's seen an increase because of college props. I, I think that, I mean, if you have a kid that misses a field goal in a championship game, like, he's still going to get the same kind of harassment. Like, it's, you're always going to have this so long as social media is a thing, so long as these kids are on social media. And the bad part about it is with NIL and all that, you, you're going to have to have social media. So there's no getting around that. I mean, it just is what it is. So I'm I'm a little surprised because you're going to have to talk to all the different regulators. It, are, are they going to try and talk to Offshore? I mean, I'm, I'm real curious about that. Is that even a possibility? You know, because like, maybe you can talk to the regulators in the United States, but you're still going to have the U.K. You're still going to have Offshore. I don't know. I'm very curious. I'm very curious what what the plan of action is. And so we'll we'll see what they do. But I that popped across this morning, and I was a bit shocked. A bit shocked to say that. Uh, topic number three. Clemson filed a lawsuit against the ACC since the last time we spoke. And 
okay. Uh, basically, this happened right after the CFP deal was finalized, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Uh, but the CFP deal gets announced, and basically the ACC signs it, and by signing it, they admit that they are a lower-level conference than the SEC and the Big Ten. Uh, they are getting about $14 million per school per year from the CFP deal, and the SEC is getting 23. The Big Ten is getting 21. And over a certain number of years, that is just a gargantuan amount of money. And, yeah, it puts the – I mean, the ACC was already uh, at a financial disadvantage because of their TV deal with ESPN. Well, now Clemson, you know, saw what Florida State did. And part of their argument here is, one, that the ACC did not follow their own bylaws – by filing that countersuit against Florida State. Uh, they every, All of these schools want the grant of rights to be public. They want all this stuff to be out there. Look, at the end of the day, ESPN has to decide whether or not they're going to pick up the rest of the option that goes all the way through 2036. They have to decide that. Like, the option is for 2027. They have to decide it by February of 2025. So... Less than a year. we got about 10 months until they have to decide what they're going to do with this ACC contract. And if they're just going to let it go off the books in 2027 or they want to open it back up for renegotiation, something along those lines, well, there you go. So this uh, this lawsuit is is big but also may not matter at all. So I'm, I'm, my guess is... And I've said it before. I think that Clemson and Florida State are, are going to be out. Uh, Dennis Dodd had an interesting article that I've, I've still got to dive into a little bit because uh, all I did was skim read through it. But he says that the Big 12 is an option for teams like Florida State and Clemson. I don't know why the Big 12 would be an option because the Big 12 makes less annually per school than the ACC currently does. Like, not only from a CFP perspective, but from their television deal. So if Clemson and Florida State were happy with... Now, maybe it's because it's less of a contract. You know, it, it, their contract's up uh, at the, I believe, uh, end of 2032. So just in time for the 2032 football schedule, or football season to start, uh, there will be a new Big 12 contract, if that conference is still around. But... Uh, my guess is Clemson and Florida State are going to find a way out. Do they bring some of the rest of the ACC with them? Like, do they do they separate this conference and ESPN only take the biggest brands in that conference and it's a smaller league? Say maybe you do 8 to 10 schools as opposed to uh, 17, which is where it is right now. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. You know, it seems to me that the uh, biggest brands in that conference – uh, aside from Miami, you know, Miami has said the ACC is great. We've got access to the playoff. We're fine. We're good. Now, they might can say that because they've got enough booster support. But eventually boosters run out of money or you run out of boosters. So, like, you have to continue getting these kind of TV deals in order to maintain um, a good, uh, you know, make sure that you are on the same level with your peers because that's that's the point of this. Florida State's peers are Florida. And, South, you know, Clemson's peers are South Carolina. You don't want to fall that far behind your rivals, especially your in-state rivals. So, yeah, like Florida State could still dominate the ACC. Clemson could still dominate the ACC. But what is it going to get you on the national level? Like, that's, that's what I'm curious about. So, I, I think they're going to get out. What that looks like, I have no idea. It seemed everything was pretty cut and dry when the Pac-12 split up, right? The Big Ten was going to take these schools, and the Big 12 took these schools. And, you know, Oregon, the ACC took a few uh, because they align academically, I suppose, with Stanford and Cal. Um, but aside from that, like, the SEC's already got a footprint in South Carolina and Florida with the state school in each one. Do you protect the geographic region? Like, do you protect your geographic footprint and not let the Big Ten in? And if you're the Big Ten, do you bring in these schools that Florida State might fit more academically with the Big Ten than Clemson? 
But Clemson certainly does not fit that mold of what they typically would go after, and they just added a ton of schools. So do you want to continue to grow to 20? And if that's the case, do they go grab these two? Because it doesn't look like Notre Dame's going to leave. I I thought that Notre Dame was going to go to the Big Ten. Still kind of think that that's going to be the case. But they appear to have a pretty good little situation here with the college football playoff all the way through 2031. Well, 2032. But neither here nor there. Uh, Let's move on. Topic number four, Caden Proctor. That's right, left tackle. He was all SEC freshman last year at Alabama. Uh, As soon as Nick Saban retired, he announced that he was going to enter the portal, and he went back home to Iowa. He is from Des Moines. Big kid. 6'7", 355, just a gigantic human being. They do not make guys like that very often. He's huge. Uh, Had some troubles in some spots last year. He's just not uber quick. That doesn't mean that he can't get quick. Um, But he's just huge. He's a big, big guy that can protect that left side. Well, he has now stated before ever even getting to Iowa spring practice that he is transferring back to Alabama. Now, the transfer portal window has not opened yet, so he is not officially in the portal, but he went on a spring break trip with some of his former teammates at Alabama and decided that he's going to come back. Now, there's a lot of rumors about how he went back to Iowa and got $100,000 in NIL deals and did some car commercials and blah, 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 and then decided he was going to go back. Uh, But there is something to the idea that, you know, and and he's the one that put this out there, uh, Iowa was talking to him the entire time he was in Tuscaloosa, apparently. So they were texting him. They were keeping track of him. They were keeping up with him to see how things were going. And, you know, that's a no-no. You can't do that. So uh, that's officially called tampering. And... You know, the, the NCAA might have might have jumped in here and said, hey, it might be in your best interest to not play for Iowa because of these uh, circumstances. So, uh, back to Alabama he goes. I think we're going to see a lot of this. April is going to be absolutely wild. Like, April 15th, you are going to see some names in that portal that you did not expect because you've got big coaching changes, right? You've got big situations with, you know, a new coach at Alabama, a new coach at Michigan, et cetera. Washington, like you get, there's a lot of playing time available at some of these spots because of the, the portal acquisitions from other teams. It's, it's going to be interesting, I think. So definitely something to pay attention to. Uh, tickets are expensive. They just are. I mean, it's you're not going to be able to get around that. You want to be able to go see things, right? Uh, you've got... All these music festivals coming up in the springtime. You've got huge stadium tours this summer going on. You've got other big-time concerts, arena shows that are are going on. But along with concerts, you've got sporting events, right? We're getting ready to watch the the Sweet 16 tomorrow night. That's going to be a big deal. After that, you've got the Final Four in Houston. Um, You've got NBA playoffs coming up. You've got baseball all summer long. And then when we get into football season, you're going to have some First-time conference matchups that you hadn't seen, right? Alabama going to Oklahoma, Georgia going to Texas, stuff like that. It's going to be expensive to get into these games. I'll just go on and tell you, Alabama's going to Wisconsin. That's going to be huge, okay? Alabama has not played at Camp Randall. I I don't know ever, but it it definitely hadn't happened in the modern age. So if you want to be able to see these games, see these concerts, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Why not save a little bit of money when you do that? And it's easy to do this. Go to TicketSmarter.com and save some money. You'll get the best deals already, but you can use the promo codes WCE10 to get $10 off an order of $100 or more, or you can get uh, $20 off an order of $300 or more with the code WCE20. That's WCE20 or WCE10. Uh, I highly, highly recommend it. Save some money. Think smarter. Ticket smarter. All right, topic number five. Fox has announced that they are going to show spring games on Big Fox. Saturday, April 13th, they're going to show the Ohio State spring game. Saturday, April 20th, they're going to show the Michigan spring game. 
And ESPN has kind of had the market on these. Uh, the ACC Network shows a ton of them from the ACC. Obviously, the SEC Network shows a ton. Uh, ESPN Plus has just got a gargantuan number of spring games. Uh, but there's only one game that's going to be on ESPN as far as a spring game, and that is the Alabama spring game this year on April 13th. Well, Fox said, well, wait a minute. Like, we, we're we going headfirst into live sports, and we want to continue to build the, the brand of the Big Ten. Why not show the two biggest brands in this conference, show their spring games, and see what we can do on network television? And they decided you know, to announce right now that they are going to show those two games. Um, and I do find it odd that they announced it less than a month before the games are going on. So I'm assuming that they thought they were going to have baseball on or something, uh, or, you know, they were just going to run some kind of regular programming. I don't know what they would well, I guess uh, Fox is involved with the UFL. Uh, maybe they're just going to situate this around the UFL stuff. Uh, but either way, it, it's going to do numbers because these spring games always do numbers. It's not huge. It's not regular season numbers. It's not playoff numbers, bowl game numbers. But, you know, springtime, it, most people are outside, like, trying to do some stuff, etc. You know, it, this is the time that you get away from football. But they do understand that there are enough people that are hungry for college football that want to see what these teams look like. So they decided to go that route. Cheers to Fox. Again, it's a market that hasn't been out there. These games have only really been on the Big Ten Network. And my guess is they saw what the numbers are doing on the Big Ten Network. And they decided, yeah, we think that we can do twice that much if we put it on Fox. And that'll be great to uh, to sell to advertisers. So cheers to them. Cheers to Fox for doing that. Uh, topic six. The CFP financials got finalized. Now, we still don't know if it's a 12-team playoff uh, after 2026, or if it is a 14-team playoff. Uh, but either way, it appears that it's going to be either 5 plus 7 or 5 plus 9, and that is five automatic bids for the top five highest-rated or highest-ranked conference champions, and then wild cards, right? So at-large bids. And, you know, there was all this talk about the SEC potentially getting three automatic qualifiers and the ACC and the Big Ten getting, or sorry, ACC and Big 12 getting two each. And so just fill out the field with the biggest conferences and that's it. Now that would have been great for the ACC and the Big 12. But, you know, because I don't know that every year they're going to get two. But in that format, they would have gotten two. But either way, the financials are set. ESPN signed the deal. They're paying $1.3 billion per year for these. And I guess that doesn't matter whether it's 14 teams or 12. It's still it's going to be the same amount. But uh, Notre Dame has got a guaranteed way in if they are ranked, uh, you know, at a certain spot. Now, of course, you're still leaving this up to a committee, which is going to be interesting. But uh, you you still got that kind of stuff. You still got uh, other other things going on here. Uh, SEC teams are going to make 23 million dollars per year. In this new agreement, Big Ten schools are going to make $21 million per year. ACC, close to $14, uh, just a little south of $14 million. The Big 12 schools are going to make $12.5 million. Uh, Notre Dame is going to make uh, around $13 million. And what else have we got? Um, oh, all of the G5 schools are going to make less than $2 million each. Uh, the For the next two years... The Pac-12 is going to get, I believe, $3.6 million. I believe that's what they decided on. Um, it might be more than that. But uh, the initial the initial report said that the, uh, or, like, Oregon State, like the Pac-12, uh, or the Pac-2, I guess, Washington State and Oregon State, were only going to get something like $360,000. Basically, they would be treated the same as uh, the independents, which... This year, it's UMass. Of course, they'll be in the MAC next year. Um, and the only other independent is UConn. So UConn's going to get next to nothing out of this unless they actually make the playoff, in which case they get uh, $6 million. But I don't see any situation where UConn will ever make the playoff. So who knows? Who freaking knows? Uh, the CFP, I mean, this is just 
a separation of the haves and have-nots. And that, that's what's ended up happening. Uh, we may not think that the money matters. You know, you just want to see what's going on on fall Saturdays. But this dictates what happens on fall Saturdays. Like, it's, you know, you, you thought it was bad with Alabama kind of dominating the sport. Um, you'll have more teams that are vying for those top positions. But outside of that, I mean, you're going to have a huge split between the SEC, Big Ten, and everybody else. I mean, it's just it's going to get bad. So we'll see what it looks like. I'm I'm curious for it. Uh, I, you know, do I think a 12-team playoff could be fun? Sure. Do I think a 14-team playoff could be fun? Sure. But how many teams are really capable of beating, you know, playoff caliber teams three straight games or four straight games? You know, it, I think that number is tiny. I mean, just very, very tiny. So we'll see what ends up happening with that. Uh, topic number seven, Georgia running back, Florida transfer, Trevor Etienne. He is now, uh, my understanding, he, he was arrested for a DUI, along with a couple other misdemeanors. Now, the DUI is not that heinous. And, and I know that that sounds weird, but uh, he's underage. He's not 21. So he did not blow past the legal limit for a 21-year-old, but he did uh, blow something, which is illegal and therefore is considered a DUI in the state of Georgia. Uh, he was going 85 or 90 in a, in a 55, something like that. He was, so, again, Georgia with the speeding tickets. And I don't fully understand why they have to do the speed. Like, I don't, uh, they, they just like to drive fast, and I don't fully understand that. But, you know, to each their own, uh, these kids get these fast cars and just want to drive all over creation. But um, it looks like he is going to get some kind of uh, punishment for this. Who knows what that might be? As of right now, uh, no, nobody has said. It looks like he'll probably be suspended for maybe the first game, and the first game's against Clemson. So that's a pretty big punishment. But we'll see. You know, this is – I think Steve Spurrier is the one that said it when he was at South Carolina. Steve Spurrier talked about how uh, they loved playing Georgia early because you could always count on two or three guys being suspended for their game because it was always like the second or third game of the season. But, you know, this is – I don't know what – Kirby Smart has to do to get through to these guys that hey you you got to slow down you got to you got to be smarter than this. Uh, topic number eight. We got three more topics. We're gonna we're gonna kind of run through these. Topic number eight. Uh, AD trades. Athletic director trades. That's right. Texas A&M hired Nebraska AD Trev Alberts. And look, they paid this man. They paid his buyout of four million dollars. Four million dollars. And that's on top of the salary that they're giving him, which it has to be just gigantic. Because why, el- why, why on earth would he leave his alma mater? He played football at Nebraska. Uh, but I know one reason why he would leave his alma mater has to do with the fact that um, the, the president and the board of uh, trustees, etc., the, the alignment was off, and they couldn't seem to get it situated. So, uh, so he left. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't know that the alignment is any better necessarily at Texas A&M, but there is an endless cash pool at Texas A&M. You can build something that has never been built as opposed to, like, trying to rebuild something because I, do we know that it's possible to turn Nebraska into what they used to be? Uh, I think that's been the question for quite some time. And so... Uh, so Trev Alberts, you know, heads over to Texas A&M, which leaves an opening at Nebraska. They try, uh, they hired Troy Dannon, Nebraska did, the Washington AD. And he just got to Washington. He had been at Tulane. Um, but he went out, took that Washington job, and his family never joined him. They never moved out there. Now, that could be part of it. You know, his wife may want, that she may prefer to live in the Midwest. Uh, or somewhere closer down here, closer to her family. Or it could be that Dannon got to Washington and looked at the financials and said, oh, this may not be something that I want to be involved in. Now, 
he he was there for some really interesting times. They got to a national title game in football. Uh, had to replace the football coach, so they went and hired uh, Arizona's Jed Fish. And then they fired the basketball coach, Mike Hopkins. So, interesting, right? And so he he did all that, did not hire a basketball coach yet. Um, now, it's since he left and took the Nebraska job, they did end up hiring Danny Sprinkles from Utah State. But, uh, but yeah, he's now at Nebraska. So staying in conference, <laughs> which is weird to say, Washington and Nebraska in the same conference in the Big Ten. Uh, so then Washington was looking for an AD, and Washington went to Washington State. That's right, their rival, and hired Pat Chun away from uh, that bunch. Uh, Pat Chun has been a great AD at a couple of different spots. Um, he's the one that hired Lane Kiffin to Florida Atlantic. Uh, he hired Jake Dickert at Washington State. He's done good things. I would imagine he's going to continue to do good things at Washington, so he stays in the state there. Uh, but a little bit surprising that, you know, they took their rivals 80. Uh, Washington State, it's going to be tough to find somebody uh, for Washington State because nobody knows what the future looks like for them. Uh, topic number nine, quarterback cadence. Ryan Day last week came out. They A lot of people were asking questions about Seth McLaughlin, right, the former Alabama center that just had all kinds of bad snaps in the Rose Bowl, uh, potentially cost Alabama the game. We're not going to say that specifically because it's not all on one guy, but uh, there were some really bad snaps in that game, and that was a problem basically all year. So somebody asked about it, and Ryan Day, protecting his guy, said, hey, we haven't had any kind of problems in practice. Uh, I think it might have been something to do with the cadence uh, between the quarterback and the center at Alabama. Well, of course, Kalen DeBoer came out and said, look, Jalen Milrow has taken all of the snaps with the ones in spring practice, and there have been no cadence issues. So we've had no problems with the snaps ever since, you know, McLaughlin left. So uh, I do find that interesting. They're, they're both protecting their guys, but we still don't know exactly what the problem was. So we'll we'll see what happens uh, if Seth McLaughlin ends up as the starting center for Ohio State this year. Everybody thought he was going to go and be a guard at Ohio State. Still probably better that he got out of Alabama because, again, this thing that Charlie Baker's trying to do, banning the college prop bets, again, there's no prop bet on snaps. Like So Seth McLaughlin was going to be harassed by Alabama fans regardless of whether or not there was a prop bet assigned to him. But Ryan Day and Kalen DeBoer doing their thing, protecting their guys, I don't blame him. This is exactly what a head coach should be doing. Um, Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders said, uh, this is topic number 10, by the way. Topic number 10, Deion says that he is going to pull an Eli with his boys in next year's NFL draft. Okay, so part of this feels kind of dumb. The other part feels kind of like what you would expect uh, from Deion Sanders. He wants his kids uh, Travis Hunter, you know, not one of his sons, but basically acts like it. Um, but Travis Hunter and Shadour Sanders and Shiloh, he mentioned Shiloh and whatnot. He said that, uh, that these guys, they're, they're going to force their way to certain NFL franchises. If you're, I guess you can do this if you don't have to worry about money. Because there is a difference in what you get paid per each pick, right? So if you get picked by somebody number two overall and you you know, they're forced to trade with the team that's picking number five or whatever, then, yeah, obviously there's going to be a difference in financials. Uh, but maybe this is smart. Like, maybe you're already talking these guys up. Uh, maybe it's given these, maybe it's giving his own kids a little bit of uh, confidence, I guess. Like, I don't, I don't feel as ridiculous about this as maybe some people do. I still don't know why you would talk about it right now before you ever get to the this football season, but uh, it is boosting a little bit of confidence. So, you know, cheers to him. Cheers to him. Deion Sanders, going to pull an Eli. We'll see if that actually comes to fruition or not. All right, go to winningcureseverything.com. Make sure you are subscribed on YouTube and, of course, on the podcast. That helps out tremendously. I am the only 
person that edits or posts or does anything with Winning Cures Everything. So if you support the channel, you are supporting me, and I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, with that said, it's time to get out of here. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to reach out or whatever, at GaryWCE. If you're old school, you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Check out BetUS TV. Check out the BetUS College Football Show. We just did another show yesterday, myself, Parker, and Kyle. Uh, had a blast over there talking about some of the latest goings on. Uh, but with that said, it's time to jump. So let's do it. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. God bless college football. And hopefully, hopefully, all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you want to toss in a question, you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Make sure and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.